All right, so we took that minute, let some more people join, and now we're ready to get started. If this is your first day tuning in, don't worry, you haven't missed much. This is day two of our online live wildlife education. Yesterday, Alex Klein covered fishes of Kentucky. Today, I am going to cover snakes of Kentucky. My name is Rachel Young, for those of you that don't know, and with me today, I have my friend here, Isabella Norid. She is going to be fielding your questions the same thing that I did yesterday. Now, I have worked at the Slato Wildlife Education Center for quite some time, a few years now, but I've held other jobs within the department, so some of you may recognize me from our Field to Fork events, our Becoming an Outdoors Woman events, or maybe just seeing me around Slato. If you do know me, you all know that these creatures are some of my favorite to talk about. These creatures are also not everyone else's favorite to talk about, but I'm hoping that maybe we can change some of your minds today. Now, I do want you all to keep in mind, this information is going to be geared towards third through sixth grade about. Please submit your questions. Kids, if you're watching, have your parents submit the questions for you. Parents, if you're generally, genuinely curious about something, submit those as well. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Now, up here, there are a lot of different species of snakes. We're not gonna cover every single one of them today, but we will talk about a lot of them. As far as numbers go in Kentucky, we have 28 non-venomous species and four venomous. We will talk about the venomous last and start with the non-venomous. But before we get there, we need to talk about snakes in general. Not everyone knows what makes a snake a snake. Now there's a few things. Snakes don't have arms or legs. We do know that part. But smell, their sense of smell is different than ours. We use a nose. They use this tongue to pick up smell particles out of the air. Hearing, we have two ears. You can reach up and touch both of your ears, but snakes can't do that. They don't have visible ears. They also don't hear the same way that we do. They pick up vibrations a little bit better than we do. So they're gonna use those vibrations, transfer that information to their brain, and that's how they hear. Now, shedding. Snakes have scales. They shed those scales. Isabella here has a good example of what that's gonna look like. They're gonna shed about every month, sometimes a little bit more if they're growing quickly, and sometimes a little bit less if they're already full grown. We are gonna talk about a multitude of sizes of snakes today. Lastly, egg laying. Now, there's an exception to every rule. Not every snake we're gonna talk about lays eggs, but a majority of them do. Isabella here has a really good example of what snake eggs look like. I want you all at home to take about 10 seconds and think about how those snake eggs look different than maybe what you would find in the grocery store, a chicken egg. Think about it for a second. Now, chicken eggs, you all eat eggs at home, I eat eggs at home, we all eat eggs for the most part. Now, if you drop a chicken egg on the ground, it is going to bust and break and make a terrible, terrible mess. Snake eggs are a little bit different. Snakes aren't really good parents. They lay the eggs and for the most part they leave them and go away. So if you're going to lay your eggs and leave them, those eggs need to be tough to survive while they are in the egg. These eggs right here, I'm going to pick them up one more time. These eggs look almost leathery, soft-like, and that's so that they have a little bit better protection than maybe a hard-shelled bird egg might. So those are the big snake characteristics. Now, I told you that not every snake lays eggs. There's an exception to every rule. This would be a good point to come back to later after you've watched this video and maybe take a picture of this slide if you're really interested in this aspect of snakes. I have listed out egg laying snakes and then your live bearing snakes. There are a lot of snakes that lay live babies. They have the eggs on the inside that get fertilized and then the live babies come out instead of eggs. I have our four venomous snakes over here. Every single one of those is going to have live babies. Our water snakes have live babies and that garter snake that you see in your garden every spring and summer is going to lay live babies as well. The first snake that we are going to talk about today is going to be the eastern milk snake. I put these guys first for a number of reasons. One, they are all over the state and they are pretty general 
for where they can live, where they hang out, their habitat. Now, I also put this first for another reason. Every single picture of these milk snakes looks different. Milk snakes are highly variable in coloration and pattern. Now, this one is really light gray with red spots. This one's brown with red spots. And then this one is gray with brown spots. This is gonna be our first snake, our live example that I have for you. Isabella is gonna go ahead and get out our milk snake so I can show you guys up close and personal, just as you would be if you were here at the Slato Center with us. Let's give her a second to get it out. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Isabella. This is our first example. This is an Eastern milk snake. Now, this snake is a different color than the other ones that I just talked about on the slide. She's almost all brown, different shades of brown. We have three different milk snakes at the Salado Center, and all three of them look so very different. And neither, none of the three look like any of these up here. So these are really, really variable in coloration. You can find these in lots of places. This snake really gets a bad rap because people look at this and immediately assume that it's a copperhead. And we will discuss how to tell the difference between venomous and non-venomous later, but this is not a copperhead, okay? Isabella? So, these snakes are named milk snakes. Now, tomorrow's one o'clock presentation is going to be given by educator Eric Schulte. He's gonna talk about some wildlife myths, so I'm not gonna steal his thunder about the Eastern milk snake because this is one of the animals that he's gonna talk about, but their name is very misleading and he will tell you why tomorrow. So, the next snake is gonna be a black king snake. These are so cool. Now, people that don't like snakes, this is gonna be your favorite snake and I promise you that right now. I'll tell you why, these guys eat other snakes. They are called king snakes because they are the king of the snake world. Not only do they eat other snakes, they also are known and documented eating venomous snakes, routinely copperheads and cotton mouths. So for all of those of you out there that really don't like venomous snakes, this is your snake. Now, we have a live example of a black king snake right here. She is not full grown. She is still growing. These guys can get up to about four feet long and she's probably barely a foot. The key identifiers on this snake are that it is black. We have a lot of different black snakes in Kentucky. So let's narrow it down a little bit more. If you look, there is yellow spotting on the back of this snake. Then if we flip up, there is a yellow and black checkered pattern on the belly. As they get older, this yellow might fade a little bit, but those specks are still gonna be there. Now, the other thing I like to identify them by is the fact that they don't have a neck. Now, I'm gonna show you this snake and then we're gonna compare it back to the milk snake. But let's look at this for a second. The body goes almost uniformly into the head with no separation for a neck there. So if you're ever confused, just think. King snakes don't have a neck, okay? So if you can see it's the same width all the way down to the head, it's gonna be a king snake. So let's switch back to the milk snake and look at that head shape and that neck length real quick. So while she's getting the milk snake, now's a good time to start submitting questions. If it's a question that maybe doesn't have to do with milk or king snakes, go ahead and ask it, and Isabella can save it for later if I don't touch on what you're gonna be asking. Okay, so let's look. It's pretty obvious right here. You can see that neck right there, and then the head widens other than on the king snake where it was one uniform length. She's not cooperating as well as the king snake did. Okay, <clears throat> so let's move on. Eastern hognose snake. I don't have a live example to show you of this snake, but it is one of my favorites, and I'm gonna tell you why. There's a couple of reasons. The snakes that we've talked about, one has eaten mice, the first one, the milk snake's gonna generally eat mice. The second one, she's gonna generally eat almost all snakes. This one is different from both of those, and the fact that this snake is gonna eat frogs and toads. Now, 
How do they do that, you ask? A frog and a toad, when they're feeling threatened, what are they gonna do? They're gonna puff up real big, make themselves look as big as possible. A big toad, she might not be able to swallow that, but she has an adaptation of a fang in the back of her jaw that allows her to pop a blown up toad and eat it. So that's what they're gonna eat. Now, why are they called a hog nose? Let's look at this picture. That pointed shovel tip nose is pointed up just like a, hog would, a hog's nose would be. So that's where they get their name from. These guys are found all over the state, but if you're looking for this snake and they eat frogs and toads, where do frogs and toads live? Let's think, frogs and toads, mostly frogs live around water. So that means that this snake is gonna hang out around the edges of water. Now, I know we're gonna get questions about, can snakes bite me? Does it hurt when snakes bite me? What do I do if a snake bites me? So let's pause there real quick, and let's talk about her defense mechanisms. Because if you encounter this snake in the wild, she's not gonna bite you. She's gonna do a lot of things before she gets to that point, and that's why I like these so much. So, let's look here. Look at this picture. This looks a lot like a cobra. And I'll be the first to tell you, we do not have cobras in the state of Kentucky, okay? So if you see something that stands up and spreads out its neck just like this, that's more than likely gonna be a hognose snake. This is their first line of defense. If they feel threatened, they're gonna stand up and spread that head out big, big and wide to try to scare you from getting close to it. Second, if that does not work, they will roll over and play dead. This snake is alive. This picture was taken, this snake is alive. Open mouth, open, gaped open, looks like it's dead. That belly, that white belly's flipped up. Now, I want you all to imagine you are a fox. Let's just pretend we're all foxes right now. And we're hungry, we haven't eaten maybe in two days, and we're on the prowl. Somebody else got to the rabbit first. There's no squirrels around, but you see this snake, okay? you're thinking, this might be a good meal, and you walk up to it, and the first thing it does is spreads its head out. You're gonna think twice. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't eat that. It's a lot bigger than I thought it was. But I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go for it anyway. You swat at it again, and then it flips upside down, and it musks. So this terrible smell comes around. It looks dead, it smells dead. I'm probably not gonna eat it. I would rather have a live meal than a dead, nasty smelling snake. So this defense mechanism works a lot for them. So this snake, if you approach it, it's gonna do all of this before it results to maybe biting you, okay? Isabella, do you have some questions for me? We have lots of great questions okay. coming in. Rachel Parker, he's age nine, he wants to know, can Kentucky snakes be kept as pets? Can Kentucky snakes be kept as pets? So. We haven't gotten to this snake yet, but I believe it might be next. It is corn snakes. I will be the first to tell you, I have a pet corn snake at home and I love her dearly. So Kentucky native snakes can be kept as pets, but what you should do if you want a corn snake or you want a rat snake, do your research before getting any sort of pet. Make sure you're prepared to house that pet for up to 15 years. Snakes, when they're well taken care of, can live for a really long time. They grow slowly, they take a while. So, if you want a corn snake, do your research. Go to a reputable breeder or your local pet store and go from there. We don't wanna take snakes out of the wild, especially these guys because they're not found all over the place. So yes, Kentucky snakes can technically be kept as a pet, but get them from the pet store. Any other questions? Gideon, age eight, would like to know, what is your favorite snake? Gideon, I'm so glad I got this question. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't have one favorite because there are so many that I like so much, but if I had to narrow it down, I'm going to say corn snake, king snake, and hog nose are my three, or my top three. And if you ask me to narrow it down further than that, I don't know if I can, but those are my top three. Anything else? Last one, Teresa would like to know, how do you know if a snake is poisonous? Teresa, okay, I was hoping we would get this question specifically because you used the word poisonous. So we're gonna do a little education real quick on poisonous versus venomous, because this language is important. We have venomous snakes in Kentucky. They bite and inject venom. Poison's a little bit different. 
Poison is something that you are going to ingest. So maybe a poisonous mushroom or something like that. So we do have venomous snakes in Kentucky and we will get to them. Isabel, anything else? I think that's it for now. All right, thank you all. Keep those questions rolling in. Isabella has taken them down as they come. So corn snakes, I've already talked a little bit about them, but I do want to touch on these real quick. The first snake I showed you, the milk snake, looks really, really similar to a corn snake. A little bit smaller, but very similar, still the same. If you find a milk snake, maybe you live in Richmond, maybe you live in Hazard, or maybe you live all the way down in Fulton County, what you're finding is a milk snake and it's not gonna be a corn snake. And that's because corn snakes in Kentucky only live in two spots, Mammoth Cave and Red River Gorge. And those are highlighted right up here on this map, those two blue spots. Just in case I haven't touched on it already, most of the maps we've seen have been blue all the way across. The blue is where the snakes are, the white is where the snakes are absent. You wanna give us the next guest? Yes, I do. All right, so our next guest is the staff favorite and possibly the entire staff of Fish and Wildlife's favorite snake that we have here at the Salado Center. She is our resident corn snake. Her coloration is very beautiful. She's arguably our most beautiful snake that we have here. Our timber rattler gives her a run for her money, but she is really pretty. My favorite thing about this snake specifically is her job. She has been here for so long and her job has been to educate kids and their parents and the rest of our visitors on why snakes are important. This snake right here that I'm holding has gotten numerous amounts of people over their fear of snakes and that's such an important job for her. I have people come in here constantly that say, I don't like snakes, I don't want anything to do with them, I don't want to touch it. I bring her out and immediately the response is, wow, she is way prettier than I ever thought she was going to be. Maybe I will touch. Maybe it's the coloration, I'm not sure, but she definitely is the favorite. And she has such an important job, just like the rest of our snakes do. Now, she is full grown. She is big. It doesn't look as big because she's kind of coiled up, but she is pretty big. These guys will get up to be about four, maybe even five feet for a big one. They're called corn snakes, but do you guys think that these snakes eat corn? All the other snakes we've talked about have eaten other animals, right? So I'm gonna say that these snakes don't eat corn. We think that they were once named corn snakes because a long, long, long time ago, I can't tell you how long ago, but at some point, somebody went into a cornfield, found this snake slithering around, and thought, maybe it's eating the corn. I found it in a cornfield, let's call it a corn snake. But these guys are not eating corn. They're eating what is eating the corn. They're eating those mice. These guys almost always eat mice, but they are good climbers. Uh, let's see, corn snakes and rat snakes, which is what we'll go to next. Let's switch the slide real quick. These guys are both very, very good climbers. This snake and rat snakes are very closely related and they're both really good climbers. Isabella? <clears throat> However, rat snakes get bigger. They're way more common. The most, one of the most common snakes you're gonna find in Kentucky. Garters and then rat snakes are gonna be the two that people see the most often or and the most familiar with. These guys get in your garages, they get in your barns. They can be found almost anywhere. They don't care as long as they're eating. We call these nature's free pest control. They have a job and they do it very, very well. It is not unlike these guys to climb a huge tree, find a bird nest with eggs, and eat all of those eggs as well. Do you have some questions? Yes. Okay, we've got um, some more. Eli, age eight, says, can a snake eat me? Can a snake eat me? Okay, Eli, we actually got a similar question yesterday about can a catfish eat me? So, these snakes, this one right here is gonna be one of the biggest that we will ever encounter in the state of Kentucky and he's only gonna get to be about six foot long, and that is a big rat snake. Our venomous snakes, they're not gonna eat you either. Nothing we have here is big enough or strong enough to eat you, and I can promise you that, okay? Any other questions? And Rachel, Asher, age nine, wants to know if you've ever been bitten by a snake. Oh, I knew I was gonna get this question. Okay, Asher, I have a confession to make. I have never been bitten, and I've been working with snakes for a long time. I go out in the wild and I find them, 
I work with them at work, but I know the signs of a snake that's about to bite. I know the boundaries, and I don't push them so that I don't put myself into that position. Now, I have picked up some baby snakes before, little bitty things, and they will try to bite you, but they're so, 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 so tiny that they cannot do any damage. Now, while we're on the subject of biting, Isabella, will you pick up the replica or the skeletons of the snakes? Now, there are two skulls here. We've got a venomous one right here and a non-venomous right here. So we're gonna focus on this non-venomous one real quick. I want you all to look at how small those teeth are. They are so tiny. There's a lot of them, but they're very, very, very small. So when they do bite, it really doesn't hurt. I know a lot of people that have been bitten and they didn't even know they had been bitten until after it happened because it's so quick and it's really not painful. So that's a really good question, so thank you. Anything else, Isabella? Yes, that leads us into our next question. Abel, age seven, wants to know, how do you know when a snake's gonna bite? Do they give those signs like the hog nose does? Yeah, very good question. A lot of snakes have different defense mechanisms. There are some snakes, the rat snake for instance, <clears throat> this snake, if you walk up on it not realizing, it will actually vibrate its tail in the leaf litter to make it sound like a rattlesnake, okay? If you hear a vibrating in the woods that almost sounds like a rattlesnake, you are probably close to a snake and that's all that that is. They will vibrate their tails. Sometimes they will stand up in that defense posture where they're ready to strike. And at that point, you shouldn't be close enough to where they can strike you anyway. Once they're exhibiting that, where they have noticed you and they're looking at you ready to go, that's gonna be your cue that I'm too close, this snake is uncomfortable. Very good, anything else real quick? I think that's it for now. All right. Well, we will keep going then. The next snake we're gonna talk about is the rough green snake. We are gonna switch gears. We just talked about a lot of bigger snakes, but now we're gonna talk about some smaller snakes because believe it or not, we have some tiny snakes in the state of Kentucky. Now, this snake, the rough green snake, is very, very, very cool because of the color. We don't have anything else like this. They're skinny, they're slender, they're green because you know where they live? in the trees and in the bushes, in forest edges. So let me go get this green snake real quick. Josh, you wanna bring it right up to me? This is our newest addition to the Salado Wildlife Education Center. This is our rough green snake that we obtained last year. If we give her a minute to calm down, she's going to exhibit a behavior that a lot of rough green snakes do. If you look at this picture right here, this snake, is hanging onto a branch and mimicking that it is also a branch, okay? And that is what these guys do to stay safe because they're very, very small. They're a pre prey species. Other snakes might eat these guys. Birds, mammals, lots of things can get them because they're so, so, so small. So that's gonna be how they defend themselves is just being green and looking like what they're around. Now, they're so tiny. They're the tiniest snake we've talked about so far. So if the other snakes we've talked about eat bigger prey items like frogs and toads and mice and other snakes, what are these guys gonna eat if they're this small? They're gonna eat bugs, okay? Crickets, bigger bugs, cicadas maybe, some worms. That's what these guys are going to be eating in the wild because they're so, so, so tiny. You can find these all over the state all over. Actually, on one of the Facebook posts about this program earlier, a gentleman posted a picture he took of a rough green snake while he was out turkey hunting. When you're out hunting, pay attention to the trees around you and you might see one of these guys. All right, Josh. Very good. Okay, now we're gonna go even smaller. There are snakes smaller than that one. The ring neck snake. This snake is really, really, really pretty. They're found all over the state, but they're very small. They don't get much bigger than about 12 inches. If you look over here, you can see the ring neck, and then you can see the ring neck down here. It's really apparent why they're called ring neck snakes. Their name makes a lot of sense. I included this picture because I did want to talk about their defense. So the green snakes, they're camouflaged in their habitat. These guys are fossorial. So what that's gonna mean is they're gonna live mainly underground. They're gonna come out sometimes, they're gonna eat and do things like that. To find them, you're gonna to wanna to flip over logs, look in leaf litter, things like that. 
This picture up here shows you their defense. If they feel threatened by maybe a big predator that they probably are going to have, they're going to flip over really quick and flash that bright coloration and hopefully confuse, shock, maybe even scare away their predators, okay? So the next snake is the worm snake. This is going to be Kentucky's smallest snake. These guys, seven inches, okay? Seven inches long, and that's going to be their average. Some of them can get a little bit bigger, but seven inches is going to be the average for this snake. They're found all over the state except for this inner bluegrass area. So you can find these pretty much everywhere, but they are going to be hard to find. They're called a worm snake because they look like worms, okay? They, if you didn't know what you were looking at, you may walk right past that thinking it's a big worm. This picture up here shows you that pink belly, and that's a really good identifier for the worm snake. We have a couple of other little brown snakes hanging around the state, but this one is easy because it has that pink belly underneath. It's got a pointy head, which a lot of our snakes don't have. It's all rounded. It's got a little bitty point on the end with a point on the tail to match. They have this little spine that helps them defend themselves if they need to. Now, you can get, if you pick one of these up, it will poke you, but it feels like a tiny little sting and nothing more than that. You got some questions for we me? We do, okay. Rachel. Evelyn, age 12, would like to know, what, what does she do if a snake comes in her home? That's a really good question, Evelyn. If a snake comes in your home, did you say you were 11? Age 12. 12, okay, so you're 12. Go get your parents if they're home. Go get your guardian, whoever you're with. Go get them first. I don't want to encourage small children unattended to go towards a snake, but they don't know what it is. So go get your parents first things first. Your parents can then decide what to do with it. For the most part, people don't want snakes in their house, and they usually don't get in the house. If they're in the house, it's going to be in the garage or in the attic or the basement, usually not in the living area. So go get your parents, and then your parents can get it removed. Good question. Our next question comes from Caden, he's six, and he would like to know, um, what do snakes do in the winter? Okay, hi Caden, that's a really good question. So most of, if not all of our snakes, are gonna go into like a hibernation mode. They're gonna stop eating, they're not gonna be coming out, they're gonna be going underground, or getting in their hides, and hanging out until it gets warm again, which is a good segue into the fact that now is the time that they are coming out. This rain, this humidity, these warmer temperatures that are going up and up as we go on. This is good snake weather. This is great salamander weather and great frog weather. All of our reptiles and amphibians are going to start coming back out because the sun and the temperature is coming out. Okay. Rachel, Tilda would like to know, what do you do if a venomous snake bites you? Okay, good question. So when a venomous snake bites you, the best thing you can do is get your keys, get in the car, and go to the hospital or the doctor. Do not try to suck the venom out. That does not work. Don't cut an X over top of the bite. That's not what you're supposed to do. There's a lot of myths and urban legends around what to do if you get bit by a venomous snake. But I will tell you, all four of our species, in, in, uh, of our venomous species in Kentucky, they all take the same type of anti-venom. All you got to do go to the doctor, and that is it, and they will get you set up. Anything else? Lastly, Jude would like to know, do, do snakes feel slimy? Oh, okay, Jude, good question. Do snakes feel slimy? They look slimy in this picture, don't they? When we use the word slimy, we use it generally to refer to salamanders and maybe some fish, but snakes aren't slimy. They have scales. They're a little bit dry. They're shiny. I like to compare it to maybe feeling a cold basketball is kind of what it feels like. Now, these pictures, it makes these snakes look like they almost might be slimy, and that's because of their scales. They have smooth scales. All the scales look uniform, they're all flat, and that creates that shiny, that uh, slimy, shiny look, and a lot of it is from the flash from the camera that took these pictures. Any other questions for me? I think that's it for now. All right, so we'll keep rolling. That's gonna be our last non-venomous snake we're gonna talk about. Now we're to the venomous, and I know you all are gonna have lots of questions about this. So we're gonna go through each one, one by one, and then you all are gonna follow me out to see Salado's venomous snake, so you all can see a live example. We have four in the state. In order from most common to least common, they are copperhead, timber rattlesnake, western cottonmouth, 
and pygmy rattlesnake. So we're going to talk about the copperhead first. They can be found all over the state. This is the only venomous snake that can be found all over the state. The other ones have restricted ranges. These are, in my opinion, one of the easier venomous snakes to identify, but unfortunately, people do confuse a lot of snakes with copperheads, milk snakes, corn snakes, sometimes hognose snakes. Lots of different snakes get confused for these guys. So let's go over how to identify them. There's a couple of key points here. Isabella, will you hold up the venomous and non-venomous heads for everybody to see at home? So take a second, discuss between you and your family which one you think might be the venomous snake and which one you think might be the non-venomous and why. Okay, this one, if you chose this one as the venomous, congratulations, you are correct, and this one is the non-venomous. So let's put this away for a second. Let's look at the venomous snake head, Isabella. Just keep that one up, yeah. There's a couple of things I wanna point out here. The shape, this triangle shape, these elliptical pupils or cat eyes and then these two pits right here all four of our venomous snakes in Kentucky are pit vipers they use these heat seeking pits to find their prey now there's an exception to every single rule in the animal world there always is so let's go back a second I told you that the venomous snakes have triangle heads I lied this hognose snake, if you didn't know any better, it has a triangle head, okay? Different snakes have different defense mechanisms. So take a second look at whatever you're looking at to be sure. So the head's a good way to identify a copperhead. Next, you are going to look at the patterning on this snake. They are called a copperhead for a reason. Right here, copper color. Up there, copper color on the head. It's pretty apparent in person. These snakes are beautiful. It will catch your eye. S last identification tool we're going to use are these Hershey kissed shaped cross bands that go across the body. You're going to have one Hershey kiss on this side, one on this side, and they're going to meet in the middle in a thin little strip right here. So look for that hourglass or Hershey kiss shape and to know if it's a copperhead or not. I included this picture because this is a juvenile copperhead. There's one thing I want to point out on this snake, and it's going to be the tail. Adult copperheads do not have this, but juveniles do. Their tail is bright yellow or bright green, okay? So, next, we're gonna go to the cotton mouth instead of a timber rattler, because I wanna talk about this one first. Cotton mouths get a bad rap because they're water snakes. But we only have these guys in the western third of the state. If you're living in Eastern Kentucky, in Lexington, in Somerset, in Meade County, you're not gonna see these guys where you live. What you are gonna see is these, the common water snake. This is what you're gonna be seeing when you see something swimming in the water. So let's talk about how to ID them. If you are in the western third of the state and you wanna know the difference between cotton mouths and a water snake, let's talk about it. What we're gonna do first is talk about why cotton mouths are named that. It's pretty obvious. They're, one of their defenses is to gape. They open that mouth as wide as they can and display that cotton or white coloration that's really shocking to the eye. They have dark brown bodies. This is so contrasting that a lot of pre uh, predator species will stop and think about what they're doing for a second when they do that gape. Cotton mouths will also rattle their tail. They don't have a rattle. They vibrate in leaf litter, similar to how that rat snake might do, to create that noise to scare a potential predator off. Lastly, when they swim, they swim with their heads out of the water, okay? These guys don't. They do not. They swim fully submerged. They don't do that gape defense. They don't rattle or vibrate that tail in the leaf litter to create that rattle mimic. But if you look at this picture, that head looks awful triangular. So if you're not sure, the best case is just don't approach it. That's gonna be your best bet. But there are ways to tell, look for those defenses. If you're in the western third of a state and that cotton mouth or what you think is the cotton mouth gapes and there's white, it's a cotton mouth. If it immediately turns and runs away, it could have been either one, but it might be this guy. These are found all over the state. Frankfurt residents. We, there are tons of water snakes. This is one of the snakes I see the most often because I'm around water a lot. 
They swim all fully submerged. They go on about their way. I've had them swim by my legs and not even notice that I was there. We are in their habitat when we're in the wild. Just leave them be. So timber rattlesnake is next. These guys have a bigger range than the cottonmouth does. They're only absent from the bluegrass, but they're found pretty much everywhere else. <clears throat> They have a rattle on their tail. That's going to be your easiest identifier for these guys. That big, huge rattle on the end of their tail. The rough scales. Most of the snakes we've talked about, smooth, uniform scales. These guys, you can even look in this picture and see every single individual scale almost looks raised. <clears throat> That's another way. Third way, the chevron bands. Isabella has a really good example of our timber rattlesnake shed that she, she just shed the other day, so this is very fresh. You can see this chevron pattern all the way down the snake shed. All right, so lastly, we're gonna do the pygmy rattlesnake. Now, this is the only species of venomous snake that Slato does not have a live example of, but we do have a replica that Isabella is gonna show while I point out identification features. These guys, they don't get bigger than about a foot and a half. That's about as big as they get. They're called a pygmy rattlesnake for a reason. They're gonna have that tiny rattle, but the two main ways you can tell, it's gonna be by this black eye stripe right there. And then I have a coworker who just told me this the other day and I really like it, so I'm gonna use it. These right here, if you use your imagination a little bit, they almost look like the bat symbol. They look like bats. And on this picture, it's really obvious that they look like bats. So if you see something that's small, all the way down here in the LBL region, okay, this is the only people that are gonna find these, really small, a tiny rattle, that black eye stripe, and maybe some bat patterning, it's gonna be your pygmy rattlesnake. All right, so before we move on, I do wanna go over a couple of things. Isabella, can you pick up these sheds for me? I'm gonna teach you how to tell if a snake is venomous or non-venomous just by its shed. A lot of people find snake sheds in their garage, in their backyard, around their house. It's hard to tell which species specifically it is, especially if it's non-venomous, but it is not hard to tell if it's non-venomous or venomous. So let's do the venomous one first. Flip it over. What you're gonna do is flip that shed over. You're gonna go to this scale right here. So on this piece of paper I'm gonna show you because it's a little bit easier. This arched scale right here. This is called the anal plate. This is where the cloaca on a snake is. Short anatomy lesson here. The cloaca on a snake is where they give birth, where they use the bathroom, number one and number two. Everything comes out of the same hole here. So we're gonna start at that anal plate scale and we're gonna go down. If it is venomous, starting at this anal plate scale, there's gonna be one row of scales all the way down, just that one row. Now, if it's non-venomous, we're gonna look on here, there's that anal plate scale right there. There are two rows of scales. Here's the piece of paper for a little bit better view, it's a little bit bigger. Two rows for non-venomous, one row for venomous. And that's a really fun thing you can do as a family. You find a snake shed, don't be scared. Take it as a learning experience. Pick it up and say, let's see if this is venomous or non-venomous. It's really easy to tell, okay? So, we are going to go out and take a look at our three venomous snake species really quickly because I do want you all to see a live version of these key identifiers. It's a lot easier than maybe looking at the pictures I put up on the board. I'm not sure what the quality looks like from your all's in, but it can't be super, super great, as great as a live example would be. So the center is empty, so it's just us. You're basically getting a virtual tour. All right, so if you've been here before, you're pretty familiar with where our venomous snakes are. We house the copperhead, the timber rattler, and then the western cottonmouth. So this cottonmouth, she's pretty interested in what's going on. So Jameson's gonna get a good close-up of her. You can actually see those pits right back here. Well, she's facing us now. When she turns to the side, you'll actually see them. Those heat-seeking pits, that's how they find their prey. They use these heat-seeking pits to find those warm-blooded animals that they're hunting, okay? This next one, 
this timber rattler, you can get a really good of idea of how rough those scales look. You can see each individual scale almost sticking up. This is a really good shot of that chevron pattern of those elliptical pupils, that pit behind the nostril, and that big triangle-shaped head. That rattle back there is also a really good shot. Now, the last one we'll talk about is this copper head. She is small. They are pretty small. They don't get really, really, really big like these two do. Those Hershey Kisses are incredibly obvious on her. And then they have those spots in between each Hershey Kiss, and then her elliptical pupils, her heat-seeking pit, and her triangle-shaped head. Now, we're going to take a second. Are there any more questions that you guys have? You got any? We do have some, Rachel. Okay. Abby and Jace would like to know, um, will any of these snakes chase you? Will any of these snakes chase you? That's a really good question, Abby and Jace. So what we like to tell people is, if you don't bother it, it's more than likely not going to bother you. Now, there is a snake that we didn't talk about today that I will touch on real quick, the black racer. They kind of get a bad rap because their name is a black racer, so people are going to assume that it is fast. And they are, but they don't chase you. They're usually trying to get away. So if you're looking at a snake and you potentially back it into a place where it thinks it can't get out of, it may think, the only way I'm going to get out of here is going through this person, and they're going to try to go around you. They're not coming at you. They're trying to get away from you for the most part. Very good question. Rachel, Alex Klein would like to know, what's the largest venomous snake in Kentucky? Good question, Alex. Our largest venomous snake is going to be this timber rattler right here. They definitely get the longest, okay? The cotton mouths get pretty thick. They have that thick, thick body, but these guys get the biggest. Very good. Anything else? Eva and Jackson would like to know, is there a snake that can change color or patterns? Is there a snake that can change color or patterns? That's actually a really, really, really good question. So our snakes, they don't really change color but they do get dull. When they are about to shed, snakes get really, really, really dull. Over their eye gets opaque. There looks like milk over top of their eye. Their coloration almost goes brown or black. It doesn't even look like they have color on them. Then they clear up and they shed that skin and they are brighter than ever. So technically, no, but there are some changes. Rough green snake, that green snake we talked about earlier, it's that beautiful green color. But we get questions always. I found this bright blue snake. What is it? Green snakes, when they die, they turn this bright blue color, OK? So the color changes aren't technically color changes. It's more life history, things like that. So very good question. Rachel, Nikki says <clears throat> that she heard if you near a copperhead in the woods, it smells like cucumbers. Is that true? So. And not about the cucumber thing, but I will say, we didn't really touch on it much. I did touch on it about the hog nose, but a lot of snakes, when you get near them, sometimes they vibrate that tail, but they will release a musk smell. And it smells bad. It smells like something you've never smelled before, and that's gonna be that musk. So usually, if you're in the woods, and you're smelling greenery, and you're smelling trees, and woods, and dirt, and then you smell this weird smell, it might be a snake musk, it might be, but it might not be. Okay, what it was. Lastly, Megan would like to know, what are some of the best ways to avoid encountering or disturbing them when hiking around Kentucky? That's a good question. So if they slither across the trails, which they do sometimes, I've been I have encountered multiple snakes slithering across trails. I just stop, let them continue on about their way. Another thing you can do is if you are going to cross over a log, before you cross, peek over it. Snakes get up against logs and underneath them, and if you take a step over that and it scares them, they may bite, they may rattle real loud, they may release that musk. So the best thing you can do is be aware of your surroundings. Check when you're going to step over something. Check on the other side of that and just watch in front of you, okay? Anything else? I think that's it. All right. Well, that'll be it for today. Remember, tune in tomorrow. Eric Schultz is going to talk about wildlife myths with you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it and keep learning out there, okay?